have any help, um, I've had to go out to the car to get my hat because most people who know me probably wouldn't have recognized me without my hat. <laughs> so, uh, and I forgot my headband, so I was like, all right, well, plan B. Uh, so anyway, I am a volunteer for the Union County uh, chapter of the North, North Carolina Wildlife Federation, and so I, we decided what, last summer that I was going to do something on bugs. So here we are today, <laughs> and I'm going to do good bug, bad bug, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I have a PowerPoint presentation for everybody here. Um, there's more paperwork in the back with QR codes and things so you can sign up for some of the things that I have in there for different events. Um, if you go to ncwf.org slash events, there's actually an event calendar and there are links to everything and it's statewide, not just local uh, programs. So that if they are doing a hybrid session like we are tonight, you can tune into any of the programs that are going on across the state. They're usually for free, so uh, but you do need to register because you can get the links then if it is a hybrid, and then also if it's an in-person uh, event, that at least they know how many folks are coming and if there's supplies that are needed and things like that will have enough um, for who registers. Um, and then sometimes there'll be age limitations and maybe even quantity of folks limitation, so we just need to know, you know, who's coming. Um, so this is the next one that's coming, that's Saturday, March 23rd, and that's going to be uh, sponsored by the North Carolina Forest, Forest Service in conjunction with Union County Wildlife and North Carolina Wildlife Federation, um, and it's in Weddington, and it's a free open work day. The Forestry Service is going to teach how to plant trees. Um, they also have pollinator seeds. They're going to plant like a pollinator uh, meadow, I think. Um, out there. So if you want to go, they need hands. So it's free if you want to come out and learn how to plant a tree and then also how to remediate because it's in a community that they're trying to repopulate the trees and also like natural common area within the community. So you might be able to get some ideas of what to do. Uh, and again, it's free. It's in Weddington and that's Saturday the 23rd and it's just for a couple hours, uh, weather permitting. Um, if you're interested in getting more involved, you can join our next leadership meeting, which is here at the Ag Center at March 20th at 530. Um, and it's myself, Brianna, Sonia, Vicki, and then a couple other folks, Alden might maybe come down. Uh, but again, if you're wanting to do something with the local chapter here, we're looking for hands because many hands can really work and you can be part of planning and things like that. So it's not a lot of time commitment. Um, you can do a little or a lot, so it's really up to you. But if you'd like to, just let us know, and we can invite you to that meeting as well. Yep, and we meet right across the hall in the Soil and Water boardroom. Yes. Okay. Next slide. All right, this one there is a fee for. Um, typically, there all of them are free, but this one is free because it's an ocean advocacy uh, workshop, and it's an overnight type thing. It's a two-day thing. You don't have to attend both days, but there is a fee depending on if you're going for just Saturday or if you're going to stay through Sunday. Um, but I looked at this and I'm like, I wish I could go because <laughs> it's awesome. There's a lot of stuff um, that you can do. So this is something you might want to check out. And the fees aren't ridiculous. Um, I think for a single person, it's like $40. Uh, and then it can go up to, to $100 if it's two people like in a room. And it includes meals and lodging and all that kind of stuff. So I don't think that's normally expensive for our two day um, with some really great um, speakers and talks and they, it's like two full days of, of that stuff. So that one I was like, oh. <laughs> uh, and then the next class that we're going to have here is Miss Beat of Turning Helms and she was a foster -er of, the, <laughs> of the possums and we didn't know this until this past summer. So Miss Beta, if you're listening tonight, I don't know if she's tuned in. Um, we had no idea this woman has had such a full life. There is nothing I don't think that she hasn't done. <laughs> I mean, folks in here that have known Vita for years, I don't think there's anything she hasn't done. But this was new. I didn't know this. So tune in for this because um, I really, I want a baby fossil, but I really can't have a baby fossil. Because um, <laughs> they're like a cat. <laughs> Just like I really would want to have a fossil. So that would be a really great uh, one to tune in. That's also going to be here um, probably in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, on April 11th. Same time, same place, same bat station. Okay, and then this is what Simon was talking about earlier. Um, we're going to be, we're going to have a booth at the Hawk, um, which is the Matthews uh, Wildlife Chapter. 
Um, it's Kids in Nature Day. They have it every year, and this is on the 15th from 10 to 1. We're going to have a booth there. So I'm going to have this and probably a little bit more for show and tell. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great, great event for kids and even adults. I think the adults learn more than the kids, you know, and they come, um, there's fishing, there's all kinds of STEM activities. They had a fairy uh, garden building station that was really cool. All kinds of wildlife, uh, Shen brought snakes, there's turtles, you know, there's all kinds of things. So it's well worth going and it's along the Greenway. So it starts at Squirrel Lake Park and it's generally just in the park, but the, it connects the, to the Greenway that goes all the way into Matthew. So it's just a great day. Weather permitting, it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, and I'll be there, yay! Um, and then we also have the Monroe Litter Sweep, which is another event. And again, this is, that's right here in, in Monroe. Um, and that's Saturday the 20th. There's all of the particulars about it. Um, and that's just to help clean up the waterways and things like that. So again, if you're looking for, if you know anybody, like any Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, anybody who needs volunteer time, these are perfect things for them to register and sign up for. Um, because, and again, to register so that we know we have gloves and, you know, and even for the tree plants and shovels and gloves and trees and things like that for folks to actually get hands on. Yes, because this is with Monroe Stormwater and so they are taking care of gloves and um, bags, grabbers bags and things like and that. Grabbers, and, yeah. yeah, so we just want to make sure we have enough for, for folks to actually do that. Okay, and this is where you sign up. So. Um, go to ncwf.org and that's go to the events and you can click on any of those local or statewide and it's just really cool. The event calendar is constantly changing. Things are always being added. We get little heads ups through email, but it behooves you to go and check weekly if you're really interested in stuff because especially the stuff that you can tune in hybrid statewide because some of the other um, programs like this are just very, very cool to tune in. Uh, lots of great subjects. And everybody's got a snake one, but they're at different times. So if you miss one, there's another. And this is being, mine's being recorded. Um, so you can access that too um, at a later date. So again, I'm Anne Marie Howell, AKA Annie Howell, much prefer Annie. Um, so this is good bug, bad bug, a primer. Somebody actually asked me what a primer is. And I'm like, oh my God, is that really cool? Like, you know, the primer, which with needlepoint, you do the alphabets. I was like, oh, I thought everybody knew what that was. <laughs> okay, maybe I need to change that. But uh, anyway, it's basically just a one-on-one on beneficial insects versus pests. I have lots and lots of photographs in this because I'm a visual learner, and I find that a lot of people get a lot more out of it when they can see what I'm actually talking about. So you'll hear me going, but there'll be lots of photographs up here. I'm sorry, I didn't do that all together. Okay, so this is part of the thing that I do, because I do this dog and pony show for a lot of kids after school programs and science, you know, for certain grades and things like that. And I always have a riddle for the kids. And it's always a, it's all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. Why? And they're like, but, but they're bugs, they're all bugs. Not true. So the difference between an insect and a bug, okay, insects are the big class of all those animals, okay? Um, they are class insecta, so that's the entire encompassing title. True bugs are in order within that larger classification. And what classifies a true bug, and the kids can rattle off, it's three body segments, it's antenna, it's wings, it's this, and yes, 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 and yes, Except true bugs are, are different in that they have they don't have chewing mouth parts, they actually have sucking mouth parts. So those are true bugs. And it's actually called the order of true bug. Um, so that's the difference. And those are examples like stink bugs, everybody knows those swash bugs, acne names, because they pierce fruits and, and discolor them and, and things like that. But we'll get into some of the cool bugs. Um, like the assassin bug, it's my spirit animal. <laughs> um, okay, so beneficials versus pests. And as a master gardener, and, and I work out on a farm, uh, a certified organic farm here in Monroe, and it's very interesting when people find that out. They're like, well, what do you do for all the bugs? Well, uh, we do, not all bugs are bad, basically, is the bottom line. 
So out of the 12 billion bugs that there are on the earth, less than 1% are actually bad bugs or bad insects. And the definition of what a beneficial bug is and a pest insect is completely based on the human perspective. Oh, it's all about us. You know what I'm saying? We're the ones who decide who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. So according to the actual definitions, um, beneficial bugs are anything that actually aid us. So whether that be pollination, whether that be through um, predation for eating other insects and things like that. And a pest is anything that bothers us. Anything that affects agri agriculture, head lice, uh, bed bugs, all of those types of pests, ones that transmit diseases, all that kind of stuff, those are actually classified as pests from the human perspective. Now, ne not necessarily a pest in the grand scheme of things because they're just doing what they do. That's what they were put on Earth to do in their particular web of life. So let's go to the next one. And uh, so if you were going to be if you have zero tolerance, and that's usually my first question when somebody says, what do I do about X bug that's eating my roses? Or what do I do about, you know, Japanese beetles? That's the big one. And fine rants. What do you do? What do you do? And it's always interesting when folks ask me about it because the adjectives that they use are very powerful. They're always like, they're destroying my roses or they're out to get me every time I plant, you know, my corn or my tomatoes. And it's like, no, <laughs> they're not, they're not, you know, that, they're just doing what they do. But the key is to proceed with caution. So some folks are just, they want to just nuke everything. They just want to go in there and spray. They just, they don't want it. They take the path of least resistance and they're just going to spray everything. But the bad thing about that is insecticides don't discriminate. So if you, even though the bag has a picture of a Japanese beetle on it, that's not the only insect that's going to target because that particular particular insecticide will also attack every insect within that particular type of insect category. So it's not just the bad Japanese beetle. It's also all the good ground beetles and all the other beetles that actually do us a service. So you need to proceed with caution. The label is the law. If you are going to use pesticides of any kind, whether it be an herbicide, a pesticide like a granular or spray or what have you, read the label. Because less is better. Don't overuse because you're just going to be defeating the purpose. And a lot of times you don't even need it. You need to assess what problem you have first and then plan your plan of attack. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So even though um, a lot of science has been geared towards entomologists and, and how to take care of pests, we're learning the hard way that the pests are outsmarting us. Most insects, their life cycles are so small. They're so short. So an aphid, for instance, could have a thousand broods in one spring to summer season. What? And that's millions of insects in that one particular class. So the time that they have to reproduce themselves, they can genetically alter themselves so quickly within that time frame. So that's what we're learning the hard way is that a lot of the pesticides of the past are now creating superbugs because they're immune to it. It's not working anymore. It's like the rats in New York City subway stations. <laughs> they don't die. You just don't kill them anymore. Um, they become part of the environment, you know, the aura of being in the subway. But anyway. Um, so I put this quote in there just because I always think it's funny because this is the first thing that comes to mind when somebody says, oh, I have these things, you know, these bugs are attacking my, you know, insert whatever plant. So the art of war, I don't know, anybody knows the quote, um, you know, 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 know thy enemy, thine enemy. And basically that's the official full quote. But in essence, what he's trying to say is, you know, know your enemy, so do your research, do your homework. Take a photograph of it. Everybody's got a phone nowadays. I never without my phone in the garden so I can take pictures. Who's that? Why is that? What is this? <laughs> so that you can better plan what you're going to do. Now, I don't have my level of ache factor is very, very low. I don't get grossed out by a lot of stuff. 
I will handpick even the grossest things off, as long as I don't get stung, I'm good. But a lot of people just can't stand insects at all. Like they just don't, they don't want, they'd rather spray from a distance or kind of be like, can you go kill that? You know, type of thing. So you need to know yourself as well to understand what your limitations are. How far do you want to go? What's your level of tolerance? Are you zero tolerance? Do you want zero eating, eating leaves? Do you want zero spots on your roses? Do you want zero? That's not humanly possible. It's just not possible. You will run yourself ragged trying to keep it up and not to mention the fact it's very expensive. So do your homework, learn what's going on, Assess, do you even need to do anything? And if you do, what do you want to do? And what can you do within your level of ick? Or <laughs> are you really going to go ahead and be out there in your garden? But the best is, is you want to go out into your garden and you want to enjoy it. And that's what I always say, especially when on the radio, the point of having a garden in your landscape is to enjoy it. It's not supposed to be a chore or oh, I have to go do that. Or, oh, this is what's going on. It's supposed to have fun in it. It's supposed to enjoy it. It's supposed to be beautiful. It's something that brings you joy, right? Isn't that that Japanese? Um, if it brings you joy, then nurture it. If it doesn't, get rid of it. <laughs> that type of thing. That's that's how your garden should be. So know yourself, understand what your limitations are, and then go from there. So as a master gardener, and this is we learned this like minute one, uh, but. You know, it's, it's very uh, important for integrated pest management, which means don't just reach for the spray can. Don't just go and hire somebody or other Joe Schmo Peter spray. Um, assess it. Do you really have a problem that needs to get to that point? Most times you don't because it's nature abhors a vacuum. I know I'm full of cliches and full of quotes and things like that, but if you get your target one pest, Somebody else is just gonna come in, you're thrown off the balance. So you need to understand what that balance is, not only for your soul when you're out in your garden, but also for the environment, because if you take care of the pests, say it's Japanese beetles, mosquitoes, whatever, then you're also disrupting the entire food chain above that. Now the dragonflies don't have anything to eat, the spiders don't have anything to eat, the lizards don't have any spiders, the birds don't have, so it trickles, or the, the, it ripples out way further than just targeting that one insect. So you need to understand that. So manage a healthy, well-balanced garden and you will see results. And the key is to get out there and scout. I do a walkabout every night when I get home. This, I want tonight because it'll be dark, but <laughs> um, I definitely do a walkabout just to see. It's a pattern. Oh, look at you. Oh, I was waiting for you all year. So that kind of thing. So I get great joy out of it. So you should do that too. This is a list of helpful websites that I know have helped me in all of my research when I was looking for pest problems, whether it be turf, you know, turf grass. I'm not a grass person. I would much rather not have any grass. Um, but there's uh, lots of different places that you can go to get information. Um, the best places to go are to go to um, any cooperative extension, it, typically in the southeast area, NC State, Clemson, Florida, Georgia, Virginia, because they're all lo local-ish, have the best pertinent information, but there are some others like Cornell and things like that that have a lot more, and you'll find database true research, not like, you know, Bayer.com <laughs> saying, just spray this, it'll work. Um, that kind of thing. So this is research-based, identifying what you have. Um, that's a really good um, link to find and how to identify it because it's mostly photographs. And like I said, a lot of times the insects that I'm going to show you don't look anything like the adult when they're little, when they're an egg or they're just hatched. So we'll have some pictures of that. Um, and there's hard copies of this in the back as well with these links. Okay, so quick Who's the good guys? Uh, broad categories, butterflies, skippers, and moths. Does anybody know what a skipper is? No. I threw that up there and I was like, oh, I don't know how to get this. Okay, so butterflies, everybody knows butterfly. Everybody knows moth. Typically fly at night, giraffe colors, fat bodies, you know, whatever. 
Skippers are kind of in between. They're a small category of like a cross between butterfly and moth. So they kind of have drabber colors, but they fly during the day and their flight patterns typically look like they're skipping, hence the name skippers. And there's probably, I think North Carolina is one of the states that has the most wide uh, variety of skippers in our particular, the Piedmont area in particular. Bees and wasps, yeah, I know. Most people are like, why are bees and wasps? Well, bees, okay, but wasps, why are they up there? Spiders, arachnids, but still a good uh, predator at its best. Some flies, some beetles, you know, everybody, these are the good guys. And um, we'll go to the next one. And these are the bad guys. Aphids, okay, working on a farm. My public enemy number one. <laughs> we are constantly fighting a constant. They, because their life cycle is five days from egg to adult, you can have an explosion <coughs> inside of a week. So if you catch it early, you can attend to it and then reap the benefits of not having that infestation. Um, and you know, some, some bugs, some bugs, not all bugs, um, some caterpillars, depending on who they are, um, and even though they're labeled cut worm, tomato form worm, blah, 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 worm, they are not worms at all. That is a totally different animal. It is actually a misnomer that has stuck around through the millennium. Okay, they're actually caterpillars to moths. Uh, some beetles, you know, obviously the ones that are mentioned there, and some mites, but that are all spider mites and things like that you might see on some of your um, plants outside and also house plants, scales, things like that. All right, the good guys, start with them. Probably one of the coolest insects on the planet, in my opinion. Definitely, if I were to come back as an insect, that's who I want to be. <laughs> that's who I want to be. So the wheel bug or assassin bug is absolutely fantastic. They are big. They are intimidating looking and they are Jurassic Park want to be insects. They truly are. They, that little thing on the back makes them look like a dinosaur, just miniature. But I actually have one here in one of my jars. And what you can see in that picture, I don't have a little laser pointer, but over here, I'm gonna chip on that. This is a caterpillar, a moth caterpillar, a borer in a tree that it has punctured and it is literally sucking the life out of. But now here is an egg mass that I took that picture is on one of my trees in my garden and I was so excited. I'm like, oh my God, I got babies. <laughs> so they do not look anything like the adult. The adult is probably two inches in length at its biggest. These guys are tiny, maybe the size of your uh, pinky nail, and they are bright red and black. Now there's a lot of impersonators in the bug insect world in nymph stage, uh, but these guys are, you can tell who they are if you get close enough, and again, you can't have the ache factor, you need to get close. They have this uh, piercing mouth part. It looks like a little hook, um, and you can see it up here. It's probably as long as their head. I mean, it's big. <clears throat> Damsel bugs, a cousin to the assassin bug, have the same type of piercing mouth parts. This is a nymph, which is much smaller, and that's an aphid to give you scale for how small the nymph is when they're starting to feed, and this is an aphid. So that is an adult damsel bug. They do kind of look like the assassin bug, but just not as gnarly. They don't have the the actual wheel on the back with the spines, but this is what its eggs look like. So if you see a blade of grass and it has like um, a filament with a little egg on it or one sticking up like that, that is a damsel bug. Leave it alone because you have predators in the making. Um, again, assassin bugs, damsel, damsel bugs, they will bite, so don't handle them, don't pick them up, because they don't know, they might puncture you too. And so their mouth parts can penetrate the hard exoskeleton of most insects. So again, you don't want to have them, you know, in your palm, you know, don't, you know, they're okay. Just look at them, take a picture. 
big eye bugs. Now these guys are tiny. Um, and oftentimes they get confused with thrips or other um, flying pest type insects uh, only because they are as small. So again, for scale, these are eight, like a, a, there's its egg, but that's an aphid as well. These are aphids. So you can see how small they are. They are about two millimeters uh, or an eighth of an inch long. And uh, the pre they predate all other insects, other insect eggs, other uh, adults, and et cetera. So they're good to have. So not all flying things, they may be flying around with the pests, but they're there for the food. Um, so again, spraying wipes out everybody and not necessarily letting the good guys do their job. Lady beetles, poster child for who we want in our garden, right? Um, I, my mom's German and she's like, with a, a marine care paper lands on you, it's good luck. So if a, a ladybug lands on you, it's good luck. So I have them on me all the time. I'm very happy, but I'm not very lucky. <laughs> um, I'm lucky that they're in my yard, <coughs> but again, this is just, I took this picture off the internet because you can see how many different styles, sizes, and what they look like. There's the traditional American ladybug. Um, but then there's also the Chinese. Um, and again, what they look like from egg to nymph or larva, it actually looks like a little worm. It kind of crawls around. Um, it does have six legs, so that's the giveaway that it is a beetle larva. And if you see these, it's actually pupating. It's kind of like a monarch butterfly. They go under complete metamorphosis. So from egg to larva to pupating to adult. So they completely change their look. So they know they're an adult when they have their wings. And that's the most uh, case with almost all insects uh, for when they have wings, is when they're an adult. Uh, green lace wings, their uh, larva look very similar to the lady beetle larva, except instead of orange on it, it's white. Now their eggs are very cool. Um, if you ever see that, it kind of looks like teeth on a comb with little tips. And it's almost like an inch long, that filament that the egg is attached to. So it's very, very cool. And the flying uh, lace wings are kind of like weird. They have a very goofy flight pattern. They kind of just flutter around and you're just like, what the heck, you're going to fly into me. They seem like they're blind, <laughs> but uh, they know exactly what they're looking for, so uh, they're really good to have. Um, and they're about an inch or so long. And they're really, really good predators, especially the larva at that stage. Yeah, I had to put them up there. Okay, so even though I don't agree with the yellow jacket, okay, because in my opinion, they are truly jerks. And like they are an insect in this world that you're just, you try to really hard find a reason why they are here on this planet. But they really do predate other soft body insects, just like most wasps. Uh, the European adult hornet there, the blue black spider hunter is very cool. Um, they tend to be solitary, and you'll find them flying, which is what might be setting off your camera, Brianna. <laughs> um, they tend to go into corners of eaves and things like that because they literally are looking for spiders to feed to their larva. Uh, most wasps and things, yellow jackets, are typically underground. And if you've ever stepped on a nest, you know exactly how much of a jerk they can be. Um, the adult hornets, the European hornets, most other hornets will nest typically above ground in tree cavities or they'll build a nest like the one that I have there. Um, but the blue black spider hunter, I don't know what, where, where they go. I, that is something I need to, to look for. But yellow jackets are typically underground. And um, they te te technically they have two entrances to their um, underground <coughs> nests. So it, you need to have a buddy with you if you're going to spray or take care of it if it's in a place where you don't want it to be um, because they will use that escape hatch, which is usually a few feet away from the original entrance hole. Um, we found that out the hard way. <coughs> um, so yeah, wasps and yellow jackets, yeah, I put them there. They're on there. They're on the list, the good list. Parasitic wasps. Uh, very, very interesting class of insects. Because um, they're very, very tiny. They're small. 
Uh, most of them are under a half inch or so long. And if you ever see a tomato or a tobacco hornworm with these rice thingies looking at its back, these are actually larvae of the um, parasitic wasps. So these are tons of little babies that are literally sucking the life out of this tomato hornworm. At this point, the hornworm is a zombie. It is not doing anything. It is not eating because it's at these things mercy. And then eventually it will defake her and then all those little bees hatch. And you have more predatory wasps. So that is a very good thing to see in your tomato patch if you see it. So just leave him alone. Okay, predaceous stink bugs. So not all stink bugs are created equal, although they look a lot alike. Uh, the anchor bug is pretty obvious. It's red and black, although there are some um, impersonators. Uh, the harlequin bug, other ones like that will look like them. Uh, but again, you can see piercing uh, mouth parts. Uh, this one actually had predated a, um, I think it was a moth or something it had in its mouth. Now this is actually a spine soldier bug. So it looks like the brown marmorated stink bug, the stink bugs that are invading everybody's homes right now because they're looking for somewhere to go because they broke hibernation. But the only difference is, is on their shoulders, they have a, like a spike sticking out. And the coloring on their abdomen here is uh, like a bright rusty orange versus a white or brown. So that's usually a giveaway. Um, so leave those guys alone and smash the other guys. Uh, nymphs look completely different. They can come in any color. They can be red and black, uh, blue, blue and red, and because uh, those are kind of like blackest blue. But usually red in nature is warning, warning, warning. Okay, it's usually a bad guy. Um, but in this case, it's a bad guy for the rest of the insect world, but a good guy for us. <coughs> Soldier beetles. Cousin, larger cousin to the lightning beetle, the guys who blinky blink. Uh, these guys are a cousin. Their um, larvae are very small. They live in the ground and they do look like a worm or a caterpillar, but they do have uh, six legs underneath. Um, they are cousins to the uh, firefly and they adult beetles do predate aphids and a lot of times certain plants like the flower that that is on is an amnimagus or queen anne's lace certain flowers that you incorporate in your garden we'll talk to that when we get to the bad guys um will bring in these predators so that it keeps that balance um in the right place all right now we're going to move on to the bad guys <clears throat> now Here's a, a picture of all the different kinds of bad stink bugs. And we've seen them all, right? And they're flying around right now, as a matter of fact. So I did put the predaceous type here so you can have an actual side-by-side. Um, -side. So you can see that this guy's more rusty brown in color, although the colors can vary, but if they're more stark, just look for the spikes. Even though that one looks like it has a spike, it really isn't. Um, this one's a definitive like form <coughs> coming out inside. Excuse me. Eggs and hatchlings, the nymphs, they go through several changes in what they look like from, and they can be all different colors. They can be gold, they can be brown, they can be um, green, and then they'll get to this stage where they don't have wings yet. Um, and they do have sucking mouth parts, just like the um, the good predators. Um, so the sheer abundance of them is actually what makes them a pest. So some of the easiest ways to um, take care of when you have a large population of stink bugs or squash bugs, things like that, is just put a piece of cardboard down in your rows uh, because they have, for the heat of the day, they tend to hide underneath it and then you can just stomp on that and, really to look at it. <laughs> and then you can keep going. Uh, but the key is they always lay their eggs underneath leaves. So if you pick them up and they're always in a cluster, uh, squash bugs, their eggs are actually very pretty. They're like coppery brass color, like shiny. So you'll know right away. You can smash them or just cut the leaf off and throw them in a plastic bag. Leave it out in the sun, let them cook, make sure they're dead, throw them in the truck. <clears throat> 
Japanese beetles, that's probably, Master Gardeners in the room, the one bug you get the most uh, questions about, like how do I get rid of them? The key is to, again, know the enemy. The key is to, to um, take care of them when they're in the white grub, their grub stage, before they become the adult and come above ground, because that's when they do their damage. So if you can get them when they're juveniles, the white grub, and I know people who've had turf or they might be digging in their garden, you might see those little white grubs. Yeah, that's them. Now, if you have birds, I would put them out in my blueberry feeder. <laughs> I would just put them on like a, uh, like a plastic covered dish, you know, that would deep and just leave them up top there and the birds would come get them. Um, and typically the female is the first to emerge. Now, in those helpful websites in the turf files, I believe they give you like a time frame of when they typically start to emerge. But most insects emergence from underground is triggered typically by ground temperature, uh, weather, daylight, there's a lot of things involved there. So because of the way their life cycle is, the females typically emerge first. They alight on whatever it is that they think is pretty and they're gonna eat. And they'll sit there and they'll put their back legs up in the air. So if you get the females that are the first to come up, and you can just walk around with a dish or a bucket of soapy water, just dish soap, just make it sudsy. Uh, and then you can just tap the plant and they'll fall into the soapy water and it takes care of them and kills them. Just make sure you've got suds in there so they can't fly back out. Um, but if you get the females, you can reduce the population greatly um, before the males come out. And then you can kind of see the party that they're having on a plant when you miss one or two, because she's the one who sends out the pheromone. Hey guys, I'm over here, let's eat. Now let's make, let's make more. Uh, some of the really cool biological controls that are out there tend to be more pricey but in the long term seem to be more effective. Uh, milky spore is actually a um, parasitic nematode, or no, well, that's one of them, but it's a bacterium that targets the white grub. So as they eat the, because it's in a powder, milky spore is actually a powder, and you put this out in your um, garden, and it's like a tablespoon every three feet, and water it in, and what it does is inoculates your soil with this bacterium. And as the white grubs eat this, it replicates itself inside the bacterium and then it's locked. And it makes more. And I'm like, cool. So this thing is doing its own damage. So the more that they feed on it, the more beneficials you have. So it is a lot more time consuming and more expensive. However, I found it in my personal experience to be the most effective approach. Um, those bad things that you can get, very bad. They just draw more in. So unless you really don't like your neighbor, you can hang it on the fence by their stuff. Um, but I wouldn't recommend getting those bag of bug things or whatever. They're just, they just draw them in because it's a pheromone. It's the female pheromone. And so it's just bringing more in. So you're better just to target. Some of the natural repellents, uh, catnip, chives, garlic, Tansy. Tansy is probably one of the most versatile um, plants, perennial plants that you can put out in your garden. Draw, it's very pretty, gets very tall, um, has very pretty ferny leaves and little tiny yellow button flowers, dries beautifully, looks pretty in arrangements, um, and it is a big draw for a lot of uh, predator, predator type insects, um, so that's a good one to have. Let's see. Flea beetles. Um, a lot of folks don't necessarily know what a flea beetle is, but they know what the damage is. So they'll see that their leaves and things look like they're shot holes, like little tiny holes all throughout it. Uh, a couple of the plants that are typically attacked the most are eggplant. It is definitely a draw for flea beetles. Um, I actually plant eggplant in two places. One is a trap crop over there. You go over there and you can eat that all you want. And over here, we'll kind of put some other uh, beneficial plants inside uh, with it to bring in the predators. Uh, very, very tiny beetles. You usually don't see them. You see their damage because they are so small and they do jump like fleas. So they tend to feel your vibrations if you come in. So they kind of leave the area. 
Um, but they do have a lot of different colorations and things like that. So seeing the holes in the leaves is usually the give giveaway as to that's the pest that's making that. Uh, companion plants to repel, mints. If you're gonna do a mint, put it in a pot. Do not put it in your garden unless you just want it to take over and just be mint. Uh, any kind of mint, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, thyme, catnip, uh, catnip, tread lightly with that one because you might be inviting the neighbor's cats as well and they could be an even bigger pest. Uh, plants to attract other natural predators uh, like tachinid flies and predatory flies and predatory wasps would be your marigolds, yarrow, fennel, uh, caraway seeds, queen ants lace. Um, there's a lot of cultivated queen's ants lace that you can get seeds nowadays that are very pretty. They come in different colors, so they're not just the plain white ones. Um, although I have a soft spot for pure white flowers, um, they do have one called Daucus dark cariota, which is a very dark maroon. It's gorgeous. And they have a blue now, which is really pretty too. Okay, the dreaded tomato and taco, tobacco hornworm. Okay, do we know which one is typically on our tomatoes? Eating it? Which of those two? The tobacco is usually the one that we see the most. And how you can tell them apart is their little horn on their back end. One is red and one is blue. The tomato hornworm has a bluish black tail. The other one is red. The tobacco is red. And I always think of that as the tip of the cigarette is red, you know, when it's on fire. So, but you can also tell from the striping, the chevrons and the dots, uh, the patterns on them. Typically, more often than not, you will see the tobacco hornworm and not, in fact, the tomato. Um, now, this is the adult moth. So, again, if you see the guy with the little ricees on his back, leave him alone because he's, he's getting eaten. He's just, he's just a zombie right there, and he's feeding those little babies. The tomato, how you can tell the moth, and again, these guys typically only fly at night. Occasionally, you will see them during the day when they're just emerging <coughs> because they pupate underground. So you will see them sometimes come up out of the ground. It is a very large moth. <coughs> Excuse me. And I have some out here. It's probably about as big as my thumb, so it's about two to three inches long. Um, a good way if you don't have a lot of tomatoes um, would be if you have your tomato cages is to put bird netting over top of it because the moths are too big to get into the bird netting so they can't lay their eggs on the tomatoes. So if you give it enough space so that they can't lay their eggs on the actual plant, you're good. And then you won't have to pick these guys off. Um, they're gnarly when you go to hand pick them off because they hang on. Like they're not letting go and they rear back and that freaks everybody out because you go to pick them up in their head, they go back <coughs> and uh, everybody's like, yeah. but uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Our chickens love them, by the way, it's lots of protein. So we hand pick them, we put them in a bucket and we take them out to the chickens. So uh, that is a very big treat for them. They, well, they go wild when, they're, when we throw that bucket in there. Uh, the difference in the adult is the, uh, the actual number of spots on the abdomen, and you'll only see that when they're kind of flying, or uh, there's five on the tomato and six on the tobacco. And that's this, kind of the same-ish on their chevron and um, uh, striping, if you will, on them. But typically it's the tobacco. Now they target not just tomato plants, okay? anything in that particular plant family, the Solanaceae family, which includes not just tomato, eggplant, peppers, tobacco, moonflowers, potatoes, et cetera, et cetera. And then the Cochiana family, which is obviously the tobacco family. Uh, marigolds have been known to repel the adult moth. Um, I actually was at a seminar where Insects, I don't know if everybody knows this, see a very different spectrum of color than we do. So they see certain plants as different colors. So marigolds apparently repel them, and also borage has been known to repel them because it releases a different color spectrum and confuses the moth as to what's a tomato plant or is it a borage plant. Now borage is a very cool off the beaten path herb. It is an annual, readily reseeds itself. The flowers are edible and they taste like cucumber. Yes. 
So I highly recommend, if you can find it, get to mm -hmm. intermix with your tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Aphids. Mm. Mm -hmm. Aphids, okay, very, very short life cycle. I've already said that. Anywhere from, ranges anywhere from five days to seven days. They range in color the full gamut. They can be white, yellow, brown, peach, green, black. Uh, they're just, some have wings, some don't have wings. The first brood of hatchlings is typically all female and they have wings um, because they can also um, change, tip the scales. If there's not very many, very many males around, all the females can procreate by themselves just so they can start the population. So it's not, they can asexually reproduce. So they are insanely hard to get rid of once you, once you have them as an infestation. It's very, very hard. All because it takes diligence. Um, you can spray them with a hard spray of water because they're soft bodied. It normally takes a lot of them out that way. If you catch it early enough, like when you start seeing this, because they're just starting to hatch and all that kind of stuff, you can just pick that whole leaf off and throw it in a trash bag, cook it, and then chuck it in the trash. And by cooking it, I mean just leave it in the sun, just leave it real hot so it just um, kills them. Uh, soapy water, dish soap in a, in a spray bottle, you can just spray your plants. Although be very careful with that because then you're using it as an insecticide or a pesticide, uh, pesticide. And it will also harm other insects. You don't want to spray the flowers. You don't want to, you know, during bee flying time, uh, you want to be very, very careful with how you're using any kind of pesticide, even soap. Okay? Even though we don't think it's a pesticide, in this application it would be considered a pesticide, and you do have to follow the rules. Uh, lots of good uh, fungi and things have been, they've been looking at. Um, I'm telling you, the best predator of this is lady beetles. We actually bought a whole bag of lady beetles, put them in one of our tunnels, closed it up, let the lady beetles out, let them do their thing, and then two to three days, it was like a vacuum cleaner. I was like, wow. And they were so happy. They were mating and eating eggs, and, everything. and then eventually they do go away because they eat all the food, so they move to where the next food source is. But the, you hopefully, have some that lay eggs so that you'll have successive um, generations of lady beetles. But yeah, they tend to be, in my opinion, them and the lace wings tend to be the two biggest predators that do the best job um, in hand picking them off if you catch them early enough. And they're usually pretty obvious to spot because they'll be underneath, usually typically the top growth of a plant, the tenderest, softest growth, and you'll see the leaves start to curl a little bit, and that's usually because they're in there sucking the juices out of the leaves, which makes it curl. So that's usually a dead giveaway. All right, so what have we learned? Not all insects are bad, right? They're not out to destroy you or your garden or your plantings or veg, fruit, whatever it may be. They are not declaring war on you. They're just doing what they do. Um, there are many, many, many more good insects than there are bad. So the key here is just to have the best offense is a good defense. Go out there, enjoy your garden, scout, take a look. If you see something that looks look a little awry, address it right then. Then this way you won't have to get to the point where now you're having to address an infestation or potentially having to pull out your plants. Most people don't want to do that because they've started with the seed or they spent a good buck at the nursery because they bought transplants and they put them in and they got them all set up and they're all pretty and ready to go. And then, ah, insects. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, do your part to defend them against any kind of onslaught and you will have a much better time with your garden. Um, and again, if you see something, research it, find out what's making it. Is it a problem? Is it not a problem? Don't do anything. If it is, figure out what the easiest way is to approach it, and usually that's just hand picking it off at the start and then going that way. So know yourself, know your enemy, do your homework. The most important thing you can do, the helpful websites is a great place to start. Those websites have really helped me in all my years of doing things. And then I am old school. Books. 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 This is probably my favorite book. My best Bessie over there got me this. 
It is a vegetable garden insect guide. It is laminated so it can get wet and muddy and gross, and it has photographs, and it tells you it's from Clemson Extension they put this out. And it is probably one of my go-tos because it has not only good but bad. They show you what the eggs look like. They show you what the adult and the nymph looks like. They tell you how many broods typically there are in a season uh, and how to combat them, whether it be through succession planting, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very worth its weight in gold. Worth its weight in gold. And it's viral rounds. You can turn it inside out, throw it in your back pocket, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, Yes, and I even put my name on it, so you'll make a lot of women. My very first insect book that I got for my daughter, because this whole collection that I have here, and I'll move to this. Um, this started because when we moved down here, uh, my daughter was just, she just turned two. And we were the first house in our development. So we were literally in the middle of nowhere. And as... People and families moved in. Our backyard was like the place to be because we were established. We already had grass. We already had a place that we already had it. So there were just two girls in the neighborhood that would come in and hang out with my daughter, and everything was a bee. Everything. They would scream, ah, a bee. Ah. That blood curdling scream <laughs> was what prompted me to do this so that I could educate them to say, okay, look, not everything is a bee. And the bees are only doing their job. You're just getting in their way. Like, don't smack them. You know, don't throw things at them. Just leave them alone. Don't, they, you know, they're not out to get you. Just leave them alone. So this has grown to, this is only one tub. I probably have three tubs like that of stuff. And I didn't even take everything out of that. Um, which is a smattering of predators, really cool beetles of all kinds that I found. So everything that you see here is local and abundant. Now you may not see them, but know that they are there. <laughs> and 99% of these are good bugs. They're really doing service to you and your gardens. So books are always a good ed educational tool for kids. Um, doing something like this, you know, if you have a child who's really in, in, you know, into an outside, you know, earthy kind of kid, this is a great way to get them started into learning how to be a good steward um, for the environment and your garden. So I have some cool stuff up here. You feel free to come up and take a look at it. Um, I do. I have other questions, and I am going to pass this around because everybody has heard probably right now about the spotted lantern fly. Please say yes. Everybody knows because I'm hoping everybody does. And if you've actually had the ability to see um, Saturday Night Live, <laughs> he did a whole skit on the spotted lantern fly, which is not kid friendly, <laughs> but is absolutely hilarious. It's on YouTube, look it up, it's hysterical. Okay, so I have a specimen, and I'm gonna be sending around the info sheet, and there's uh, more copies of the info sheet in the back. But um, a master gardener friend of mine brought this back from Maryland, and I was like, oh my God, I need to have it so people can put it in perspective as to what it looks like versus pictures, because everything looks so huge in pictures, right? But no, it's actually a very tiny bug, but their population explosion is just absolutely incredible, which is why they're such a pest. And they are slowly moving into North Carolina, um, and we definitely want to head it off at the pass. Where are they from? Um, they were introduced, I believe, in Pennsylvania very recently. I'm going to go crazy and say it was like the late 90s, early 2000s, maybe not even that long. But because they lay thousands of eggs, you know, an adult, um, their population explosion is just crazy. And the fact that they're traveling, it's mostly through firewood and on the undersides of people's vehicles that are driving through these areas that are heavily so yeah, I think NCBA was going around with like mirrors underneath the cars, like they were doing that in certain counties just to make sure that folks weren't bringing them in in wheel wells and, and things like that. So that's all I got. So if anybody's got questions, fire away. Our question back here right now. Okay. See, this is a simple question. So once upon a time, we always told everybody. Every winter to go out there and clean their gardens up, like scorched earth, 
break everything out, cut everything down, take it out, and set it on fire. Nowadays, we don't do that. Now we're like, hey, you know what? Leave these things for pollinators. What is your feeling on when is the appropriate time to do cleanup? Is it after you're at 50 degrees for a period of time? Is it just when you just can't stand it anymore? What is, how do you feel about it? What do you suggest? Yeah, it totally depends. And that's okay. <laughs> now, it depends on your level of tolerance. I have a very high level of tolerance of leaving the leaves. And that's the mantra that um, all the pollinator, uh, uh, from pollinator.org to Xerxes Society, everybody's talking about leave the leaves in the fall and no mow May. But here it's like no mow March because all your grasses and everything. The point is the no mowing in the leaves. Um, is to leave the early weeds that are blooming for the pollinators because it's so warm. They're triggered by this temperature as well, so they need something to forage on. So it's always good to have something out for those beneficials. The second thing about the leaves. Now, I've done an experiment in my yard. This is the second year. The first year, I really left the leaves. Like, I have full-on woods, mature oaks, and I have a blanket of, like, leaves this thick, and I left it. I just left it. The problem I found was, one, it was too thick because a lot of the plantings that I had underneath it had, had trouble coming up, like especially my early bulbs, things like that. So I had to kind of, you know, do that. But I did see the alternative. The benefit was I had so many more fireflies, which was stunning. Um, I had so many more beneficial beetles, like lady beetles, um, and I had a lot more spiders which I thought was great because a lot of them don't necessarily make webs, but they leave it, live in uh, the leaf litter and on the ground. So I found that I had a lot less pest pressure because I had more beneficials because I left the leaves. Now, there are two schools of thought. There are lots of pests that also like that leaf litter, but again, if you have a good balance, I didn't see a problem where one was outnumbering the other. I was like, okay, cool, you guys do get out. I'm good. This year, I didn't leave as many leaves. So what I did was I had thinned, like I had raked up some of the first ones to drop and then just to not have it be so heavy. And then I left the final ones, like the oaks always hang on till the bitter end. So I had raked up most of the maple leaves, things like that, put that in my compost pile, but I left the oak leaves. And that seems to be so far better because everybody was able to come up through it without my intervention. So that was good. So I was pretty happy. So yes, once the ground temperature comes to oh, nighttime consistently above 50, that's when you can go in and start cleaning stuff up. Yeah, long answer for short question. Yep, that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, some of the, what, what about shredding the leaves and using them as mulch? You can shred them. Um, I used to do that a lot initially, uh, but what if you do it early when the leaves first fall, then you're good because a lot of the insects and things haven't yet settled in for their winter hibernation, if you will, it's called hibernation. Um, so if you do it initially and then put it back, then you can give them a chance to settle into the shreddings. Um, Cause I used to do that in a lot of my beds. I didn't bother buying mulch. I, I have a chipper that is huge. And I have that thing every spring um, because I use that to do uh, mulch along my fence line and things like that. But I do it early in the season. Like now I won't shred uh, any of my leaves because everybody's all in there, tuck your leg. All right, what are some of the other questions? Any other questions? How do you feel about mosquito control? Is BT the best way to attack that in red barrels? Uh, yes, the little dunk things, the best way to do it because it's safer for other critters that might be in there. Like I have frogs that find their ways into my sealed free barrel. And I'm just like, you guys go. Because they're so loud, they could come up through the downspout and get into it. So I don't want to hurt them because they're doing me a service. Uh, but yeah, those little, uh, I know we're not supposed to throw out brands, but those little mosquito dunk donut things. Um, I break them up because the rain barrel is small, so I kind of use a quarter of one in a rain barrel. I have one in my fountain, I throw them in my fountain. Um, but I have a very healthy population of dragonflies, so I'm lucky um, that I don't really have to do too much of that. So, but yeah, I highly recommend those. That's probably the easiest way to control them. 
But again, you need to be diligent because after the rain and it overflows or you may have to re-add, you know, um, and they tell you if it's what every six, eight weeks or something. Just read the directions, very important. What native plants attract beneficial predatory insects? A lot of, um, didn't we just have that class? Was that a successful gardener class or is that coming up? That With was, Lisa uh, Tompkins. Lisa Tompkins did last week. Last week. Okay, um, so there's probably a huge number of them. Yarrow is a really good native flower to plant. You can get the white, which is uh, spreads very readily. Um, some people don't like it in a very manicured garden because it does spread very easily. There are cultivated versions of that in other colors. They come in yellow, there's red, there's one that's a paprika, lovely orange color. Um, and they also come in different shades of pinks uh, and salmon colors. So that's a pretty one to have. That was a hybrid event, so eventually it will be on our YouTube. Okay, Lisa Tompkins. Yep. Yeah, and basically it was uh, last month that it was replacing are you putting natives in your landscape to draw yeah, remove, in? Yeah, and removing in, or, and removing invasives with natives native, and replacing yeah. them. Plant -wise, not that. So will that be on the Union County Master Gardeners? Yes, the YouTube channel. YouTube channel. Okay. It's not yet, but it will successful be gardeners. Okay. Um, yeah. So other native plants to put in would be good, like the tansy. Um, that's a medicinal herb. It's not easy to find, but you could. Um, just some of the ones that are real easy to find and start from seed, like marigolds. I know they're not native, but they're a really great draw, uh, and they just add a lot of pretty color, and they're edible. So think about doing double duty. So if you're going to put some uh, flowering things in with your veg garden, um, think about nasturtiums, because they're edible. Violas that are blooming right now, pansies, the flowers are also edible. Um, some of the warmer season ones would be like your borage, um, and then also um, Coreopsis is a perennial. Um, that's a good native plant to put in your garden as well. And there's just a lot of different native shrubs that bloom. You could probably speak more to that, Sandy, like the Virginia Sweet Spire, Buttonbush. Um, you know, if you want something larger, that, and also look at the bloom times. Uh, Cooperative Ascension has a really great. Um, Link and it's uh, growing natives, butterflies in your backyard. So if you go to the uh, Cooperative Extension website and put butterflies in your backyard, there's a whole list of what butterflies go to what plants, and 90% of what they list there are natives. So it's, it would be a really nice place to start to find that. Uh, the best area to leave debris for inter insects actually is both. Um, but I find I have very high shade, so my mature oaks, the tree line is very, very high. So I have morning sun and afternoon sun, but during the middle of the day, it's very shady. Um, so I kind of leave them just beyond my tree line, like in my tree line. I don't keep them out um, in the sunnier parts of my yard. Although it would benefit having some in the sunny part as well, like along the fence line if you have a bed. Um, you know, underneath shrubs or things like that, that would be a perfect place to leave leaf litter underneath shrubs or things like that. And then you don't have to buck up for wood chips or pine needles or, or things like that. Just put your leaves in there. All right. Any other questions?